We love to be able to take our pulses to know how healthy we are. But what if we can take the pulse of the ocean to know how healthy the ocean is, and as a result, how healthy our planet is? Today, that is extremely difficult. The reason it is difficult, it is very hard to deploy sensors in the ocean at scale. So what we did is we developed a new camera that is about 100,000 times lower power than the lowest power cameras that exist. The ocean is the largest part of our planet, and yet it is the least explored part of our planet. Um, you could almost sense most of the Earth's surface. Once you go a few millimeters below the surface of the ocean, we've seen less than 5%. We've sensed less than 5%. And yet, we need to be able to sense the ocean in order for us to build better climate models and accurate climate models, to be able to understand when, thing, when bad things are happening and be able to react to them before they actually happen in the ocean. One of the biggest challenges in aquaculture farms is the spread of diseases. Usually these are offshore. If disease happens and it spreads and you're not able to detect it early, it could wipe out an entire season. Tons of food um, for population. So one of the applications that we want to uh, de uh, deliver is taking our camera, deploying it in the aquaculture farm and just monitoring the fish there and being able to detect early if a disease happens. For younger inventors finding the right mentors, they can help them understand this is the state of the art. This is what humankind has achieved as the limits of science. It is really important to understand that. As a professor, as a, I advise PhD students and postdocs, a lot of what I want is to develop their courage in thinking about the problems that they want to solve and not asking the why, in as much as asking the why not. Why is this not possible? Because by asking why not is how you get to how you can enable something and make it possible. So bacteria, viruses, fungi, pathogens, they mutate over time. Uh, that's a defense mechanism for them uh, against antibiotics. As soon as antibiotics were discovered by uh, Dr. Alexander Fleming in 1928, who discovered penicillin, uh, they started to think uh, about mutation. So when uh, Dr. Fleming was receiving his Nobel Prize, in 1945, bacteria was already changing. There has to be good uh, surveillance. You know, there has to be good uh, disease intelligence so that we catch these infections, uh, we catch uh, resistant bacteria or pathogens early on. So 
so I would say that it's a disease of poor, mostly. Uh, it's a disease just like tuberculosis. Uh, you find it more in the low and middle income countries, uh, countries like India, countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Using artificial intelligence, you can design new molecules uh, much more easily. You can conduct some of the uh, efficacy and safety studies. Uh, doing clinical trials will be uh, faster and uh, more cost effective. There has to be good and sensible use of antibiotics. Uh, both for human as well as for farming and agriculture. argue that it's important that we protect the integrity and health of our planet Earth because that is our home. For us to properly care for it, we really need to understand it. And for us to understand it, we need to monitor it. So our ability to actually pick a location um, honing on this location and really ask the questions about what types of ecosystems, for instance, are in this area? Um, how many of them are in the protected areas? Um, how many of them are, or what is the percentage, I should say, are at the risk of collapse? Uh, what is the condition of this or that ecosystem type? I think about what Earth observation really can do for us as a society, as humanity. I think about survival, no less. Um, and I think about the ability of us as informed citizens to transform our society into being a lot more responsible and accountable for the choices we make, both as consumers, but also in terms of who we put at the leadership of our governments. That is really one of the most fundamental changes in how we do business that we see these days. It's this cross-sectoral collaboration. Getting conservationists, ecologists, and data scientists into a single room is really critical for us to be able to deliver on this transformative kind of information product. probably also a set of hypotheses that humans cannot com come up with for a variety of biases that are in some, some cases uh, cultural, in some cases basically innate to humans. And so going beyond that and using machines to expand a set of possible hypotheses that we could, would have ever considered, that's really where AI will shine. And so I really expect hopefully major breakthroughs uh, in AI that we couldn't have thought of before or without the technology. You can now use AI imagination 
to create molecules with the desired properties that do not exist in the known chemical space. So something that uh, is precisely tailored for um, specific protein targets driving major diseases uh, that does not exist in nature can be created by AI. We can also uh, develop materials that are very efficient at capturing uh, carbon dioxide, uh, so direct air capture for CO2. Uh, currently, we are in the process of testing some of those materials, but what, from what we see from the early experiments, the results are fascinating. I'm very intrigued with the potential of how much creativity uh, the AI can bring to the scientific discipline. Uh, one part is because um, I think right now all the disciplines are very um, uh, specialized. I think AI is just a very good generalist and it's probably better than it's already better, I think, than a lot of the scientists' comprehension of other disciplines and how we can channel that and how we can use it uh, to its fuller extent.